Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topics 1.9 and 1.10, which are trophic levels and the 10% rule. So we'll be talking about how energy flows through ecosystems and how the available energy decreases as we move up the trophic pyramid. We're combining two different topics here today, so we have two different objectives and two skills to practice. The first objective is to be able to explain how energy and matter flow through trophic levels. And the second objective is to be able to determine how energy decreases as it flows through an ecosystem. The two skills we'll practice at the end of today's video are explaining an environmental concept or process and then calculating an accurate answer with units. So we will be doing some math at the end of this video. So before we talk about how energy flows through ecosystems, we have to establish the conservation of both matter and energy. So very important to remember that matter is never created or destroyed. It only changes forms. This is key to understanding how both matter and energy flow through ecosystems. So let's take a look at an example. When a tree dies, the tree will get decomposed and we may not see the tree physically anymore, but all of its matter was conserved. So the carbon, the nitrogen, the water and the phosphorus within the tree were all returned to either the soil or the atmosphere or went into the bodies of decomposers. And so we did not actually lose any of the matter. It looks different but it still exists and it's just transformed into a different state. Let's talk about this with regard to energy as well. So if we look at photosynthesis, we have the sun's rays, which represent light energy, and they're going to be converted into chemical energy by the plant, and that's glucose. So if we look at the diagram and we were to actually count up all of the atoms involved in that process, we'd see that all of the carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen entering the plant as carbon dioxide and as water flowing from the soil are all going to be conserved either as glucose or as oxygen that leaves the plant's leaves during photosynthesis. So photosynthesis helps us kind of grasp here the conservation of matter, but also the conservation of energy because we have the sun's rays that hit the leaf, that's a form of energy. But once those rays hit the leaf, they're not destroyed, they're just transformed into glucose, which again is chemical energy. So photosynthesis is a really helpful way to remember both the conservation of matter and energy. We have a fancy name for this. It's called the first law of thermodynamics. And that's just a reminder that energy is never created or destroyed. It's just transformed into a different form. Biogeochemical cycles that we've spent the last couple days on. So the water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, those all demonstrate that there's conservation of matter. So again, when an animal dies, the nitrogen in its body is never destroyed, it's just transformed. It goes through ammonification, returns to the soil as ammonia, and then can be used for plant growth in the future. Food webs, which we'll focus on today and tomorrow, are how we demonstrate the conservation of energy. So we talked about the conservation of energy with photosynthesis, but let's look at it with an animal here. So let's uh, imagine that a rabbit is going to eat the leaf that produced that sugar through photosynthesis, so the leaf is no longer there, but the energy in the leaf has been transferred to the rabbit. The glucose in the leaf is going to be broken down by the rabbit's body. It's going to feel growth of the rabbit. So some of it might be converted into muscle or fat tissue within the rabbit. Some of it might go to fuel the rabbit's movement. So that energy is conserved. It's never destroyed, even though the leaf was eaten by the rabbit. Now we'll talk about what happens to energy as it transfers between trophic levels. So each time energy transfers from one form to another, some of it is lost as heat. Now it's not destroyed, but it's just given off to the surrounding environment and it's no longer useful energy that can be used by organisms. And so we'll talk about what that means here in a second. So let's take a look at an example with electricity generation. If we have this coal fired power plant here and all of the potential energy in the bonds of that coal are released and converted into electricity, only about 35% of the energy that was in the coal is going to actually make it to electricity. The other 65% is going to be lost as heat while the coal is being burned. Then as that electricity is flowing down transmission wires, another 10% or so is going to be lost and only about 90% of the electricity is going to actually make it into your home. Then when you turn on a light bulb, 95% of the energy flowing into the light bulb is lost as heat, meaning only 5% is coming through as actual light energy. So what this demonstrates is each time we transfer energy from one form to another, so from chemical energy in coal to electrical energy to light energy, we're losing some of it as heat. Now we can think about what this means as it applies to ecosystems. 
So each time energy is transferred from one organism to another, the amount of available energy is decreasing. And that's because the organism that was just eaten had used up most of the energy for things like movement, development, and just cellular respiration, fueling all of the processes its body needs in order to survive. So we can look at an example here with an ecosystem. If we have a thousand joules of light energy that the producers are receiving, remember they're gonna need to use 90% of that. So they're gonna use 990 joules for their growth, for their metabolism, all of those things. And only about 10 joules are gonna be available to the elk. When the elk eats the grass, it gets those 10 joules of energy, but then it's gonna use up nine of those joules for, again, development, cellular respiration, and it's gonna be lost as heat to the atmosphere. Then when the lion eats the elk, and I don't know what kind of ecosystem we're in here where a lion eats elk, but it's just a helpful diagram. It's only going to get that one joule of energy so that means that each time the energy transfers from one organism to another, only 10% of the energy is making it to that next organism. So because the amount of available energy decreases with each step you go up the trophic level, we use a pyramid shape to represent this. And trophic just means growth or nourishment, so that's a helpful way to remember what a trophic level is. And so because there's the most energy available at the base, it's going to be the widest. And then each level up is going to get a little bit more narrow because there's less available energy at that level. Remember, we didn't actually destroy energy. It was used up by the organism. So it was lost as heat as they move around or is used up in cellular respiration. But only about 10% of it is going to transfer onto the next level. And so we have a handy rule to remember this and we call it the 10% rule. 10% rule just reminds us that only about 10% of the energy from one trophic level makes it to the next. The other 90% is lost as heat while the organism uses that energy for all the processes it needs to fuel. So if we take a look at this diagram, we can kind of see that represented here. From the producers, only about 10% of the energy is gonna move on to the rabbits who are the first level to consume the grass. 90% will be lost as heat. Then onto the snakes, another 10%. 90% loss is heat, and the same thing for the top predator here. Now we'll talk about the names for each trophic level, as well as how the 10% rule also applies to biomass. So at the bottom, we have the producers. These are the plants, and they form the base since they are going to produce the usable energy in every ecosystem. Remember though, they're not really making the energy, they're just converting light energy into chemical energy in the form of glucose. The next level is the primary consumer level, and these are the animals that are eating the plants to get their energy, and we call them herbivores. Then we have the secondary consumer level. These are animals that are going to eat primary consumers, and so we call these either carnivores or omnivores because sometimes these secondary consumers also eat from the producer level. So this example here of a blue jay, a blue jay eats some animals, but also eats some plants. Same thing with a raccoon, and so we call those omnivores, and they can belong to two different trophic levels. Then finally, we have the tertiary consumers, and these are our top or our apex predators. So these are organisms that are going to feed on secondary consumers. Now we'll talk about the 10% rule as it applies to biomass. So because energy is needed for growth and only 10% of the energy from one trophic level makes it onto the next, that also means that only about 10% of the biomass can be supported. Now, what is biomass? Biomass just refers to the total mass of all living things at a certain trophic level. And so if we were to look at this diagram here, at the base, we could support about a thousand kilograms of producers, but since only about 10% of the energy moves on to the primary consumer level, that means we can only have about 10% of the biomass as well, since all biomass needs energy in order to be developed, to be grown. So we're only gonna be able to support about a hundred kilograms of primary consumers from that thousand kilograms of producers. Then that's gonna decrease by 10% again, by 90%, excuse me. Uh, so we'll have 10 kilograms at the secondary consumer level. And finally, when we get to the top of the pyramid, there can only be one kilogram of tertiary consumer biomass for every thousand kilograms of producer biomass. So this is really important. I wanna reiterate this. At the base, only 10% of that energy moves on to the primary consumer level. So only 10% of the biomass can be supported. So that's why when we look at a given ecosystem, there are far, far, far more plants than any of the animals in the ecosystem. And that's because you can only support 10% of the primary producers that you had at the consumer level. Same thing with the secondary consumers. 
and same thing with the tertiary consumers. So now we'll practice actually calculating the amount of energy available at different levels. So it's a really simple calculation. To calculate the energy available at the next trophic level up, you're just going to move the decimal spot one place to the left or just divide by 10. So if we use this example where we have 95,000 joules at the producer level, we would just move that decimal place one spot to the left or divide by 10. And that should give us 9,500 joules, roughly, that would be available to the primary producers. So what I want you to do is see if you can calculate the secondary producer level and the tertiary producer level. So again, pretty simple. We're just moving the decimal place one spot to the left or dividing by 10. So at the secondary consumer level, we'd expect 950 joules and then only about 95 joules available at the tertiary consumer level. Since the 10% rule also applies to biomass, we can do the same type of calculation to determine how much biomass would be found at each level. So starting out with 80 kilograms of the secondary consumer, I want you to see if you can work both up and down the pyramid to figure out how much biomass would be supported at each of those levels. So again, we're just moving that decimal place one spot to the left to figure out the tertiary consumers, which would only be eight kilograms. But we're actually gonna do the opposite and move the decimal place to the right as we go down the pyramid. So that would give us 800 kilograms at the primary consumer level and 8,000 kilograms at the primary producer level. So our practice FRQs for topics 1.9 and 1.10 today, will be covering two different skills. One is explaining an environmental concept or process. The other is calculating an accurate answer with units. So first I want you to explain why a relatively large forest can only support a small number of wolves. And then I want you to calculate the amount of energy available to a tertiary consumer in an ecosystem where there are 100,000 joules of energy produced by plants.